This morning, I mean, we're, this is Labor Day, and uh, so I love talking about work. I want to talk a little bit about work, but when I do, um, the verses that, that we use for work could be put in anything that you're, any activity that you do, including your leisure. So um, I, I want to just, but I'm going to be starting with work. I'll be talking about work, but keep that in mind. Um, you know, like many of you have had many different jobs. You know, I started out, I had a job f to pay for gas and insurance in my record albums. Remember record albums, you know? <laughs> Those are expensive. And um, then it was getting through college. And then I had a job to, you know, get in the apartment. And, and then I got married. And, and uh, so the, the point, though, I never had a job that I considered to be a career or even a career path. So the job itself wasn't that important to me. It was just a means to an end. And um, I... Uh, Three years later, we came, um, we went to the mission field in West Africa. That was the first time I had a job I felt like God called me to for my career. I thought God had called me to be a career missionary. So we were there in West Africa for three years. We came back for what we thought was a nine-month furlough, and the Lord unexpectedly told us to just wait. So it's like, okay, so, you know, I got a job, another job while I'm just waiting to get back to the mission field, and I ended up working in an insurance company. And uh, the years started going by. I started getting depressed. I thought, you know, I wonder if I miss the Lord, and I wonder if I'm getting a career that I didn't even want to have. <laughs> you know, the years are going by. That was a career job, but it wasn't the career I wanted to have. The Bible says in Col Colossians 3.17, whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus. That's the thing I'm talking about. Uh, that word whatever is a big, giant word. Whatever, it, it's like whatever you do or say everywhere we go. It could be your job. It could be at home, school, um, leisure, retirement. Whatever you do or say all the time, do it as a representative of the Lord. You know, and, and we, we represent the life of the Lord by what they call the fruit of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit produces this in us by faith. We can't possibly work up to, you know, how are you going to represent Jesus? You think you're as good as Jesus? You're not going to do it. And so that's why he died on the cross and gave us the Holy Spirit. He does it. He supernaturally does it through us through faith. He allows us to represent him. Then we can do it. And so we represent the life of Jesus by the fruit of the Spirit, like wisdom and character, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. And we represent the ministry of Jesus with these spiritual gifts that are, are um, actually supernatural talents to help other people. Um, that, that we are given. And so, you know, I saw every job that I was in as a mission field in the sense that, you know, the job wasn't that important to me, but I wanted to be a good example for the Lord, and I wanted to pray and care and share for the people around me. Um, and I learned stuff from every job, you know, that would help my spiritual life. Um, but I, now I realize the Spirit um, wants to take us way beyond that. And there's a scripture about it in Ephesians 6. We don't have any verses up, I don't think. Oh, yeah, we do have some verses up this morning. Uh, first Carly, then me. Um, Ephesians 6, 5 through 9. Um, it says, Slaves, obey your earthly masters with deep respect and fear. Th this, is another, th this is another one of those verses. You just can do a flyby. But if you start thinking about it, it's an amazing verse. So slaves, obey your earthly masters with deep respect and fear. Serve them sincerely as you would serve Christ. Try and please them all the time, not, not just when they're watching you. As slaves of Christ, do the will of God with all your heart. Work with enthusiasm as though you're working for the Lord rather than for people. Remember, the Lord will reward each one of you, us for the good we do, whether we're slaves or free. And masters... Treat your slaves in the same way. Don't threaten them. Remember, you both have the same master in heaven, and, and he has no favorites. Oh, um, slavery in the Roman Empire. I don't, I don't have time to talk a lot about slavery, but just a few notes. Um, slavery in the Roman Empire was different from slavery in North America in many, different, in many ways. Uh, one big one was it wasn't race-based. Um, and many of the slaves in the Roman Empire were actually better off um, being slaves um, if they had a kind master, some of them had very good jobs. Um, and so the New Testament doesn't speak against slavery um, like Spartacus, you know, when he incited the slave rebellion. 
But what the New Testament did do is it cut the roots of slavery because it declared that master and slave are brothers and sisters. Um, in books like Philemon, where he appeals to, appeals to him, my, my, take care of my son. Y you know, when you put that into slavery, it kind of wrecks it. <laughs> and, and Christians, from the very beginning, were caring for slaves. Um, and they, they, they were the, the initiators of abolition movements in the 1600s, 1700s, 1800s. William Wilberforce, a famous Christian who, who managed to get slavery abolished in England. Did you know slavery was their number one gross national product? Slavery. And they abolished it. They, they got rid of it. Um, and then the great Second Great Awakening in America, a great revival, it really fueled abolition in this country, um, which we ended up having, this, unfortunately, the Civil War. But Christians have always been in, involved in that. Now, in Roman times, even though some masters um, were kind and some of the jobs they had were actually good jobs, and way better if they, they, they might have been way better off if they being slaves and being homeless or whatever might have happened to them. But, you know, we have to, to tell ourselves, Paul wrote this to all slaves. It doesn't say, um, uh, you slaves that, that have a good job, you be enthusiastic. The other ones I understand. <laughs> he didn't say that. He just said, slaves, all of you. You know, it's like, uh, um, and now I'm, it, it included people, in other words, with bad slave jobs and bad masters, cruel masters. Now, I'm sure if we s were in a small group here, like one of those 300 person small groups, you know, we got a chance to share, we could probably swap some good bad job um, stories. Anybody here have a good bad job story, you know, that <laughs> you could share, you know, a bad boss story? <laughs> you know, but um, none of our bad job stories is ever going to match up to a bad slave job story or the cruel master. I mean, at least we could quit, right? You can't fire me, I quit. You know, they couldn't quit. You know, forget about low pay, it was like no pay. Now, um, I believe for me, when I read this verse, the word slaves to me, I substitute in there, worst job I have ever had. <laughs> That's to me how I, I, I look at slaves. I believe that God is speaking to us uh, through this verse and I would like you to imagine right now being back at the worst job you've ever had or the worst boss you've ever had, and now imagine that it's your career, and you're still there. Can you feel the burn? <laughs> Ooh. Now you're starting to, we're starting to get into the spirit of this verse so we can see the incredible, uh, amazing verse that it is, the power that's released in it. Now imagine the spirit empowering you right now to sincerely respect that bad boss, to give him or her sincere respect. Wow. Imagine that you're going to do your best work. You're going to go that extra mile all the time, no matter who's looking or who isn't looking, no matter what other people are doing or thinking. You know, if you do a really good job, isn't it sometimes you're going to really hear it from the other employees? Hey, knock it off. <laughs> you're making us look bad. You know, they don't, I don't, they don't like you anymore. But imagine if you said, I don't care. I'm still going to do a great job. You know, I, I, if I think about that, uh, imagine that worst job that I'm thinking of. Imagine doing that with genuine enthusiasm, being actually enthusiastic each morning, every Monday morning, being enthusiastic in, in every day. I mean, for me, I think back of some of the jobs I have, and I think, man, that feels like it'd be a miracle. You know, and, and if I thought of a, if I saw a slave doing that, I would say that is a miracle. That's a flat-out miracle. It, it says in in First Thessalonians five sixteen through eighteen. I love this verse. To me, it describes the presence of God and is speaking to slave and free. It speaks to everyone. It says, "Always be joyful." Think about that verse. Be joyful when you're in the mood. <laughs> it's always be joyful. Never stop praying. Be thankful in all circumstances. Uh, I, I know that they had the eight um, wonders of the world. Have you ever heard of that in the ancient world? You know, the eight wonders of the world. Well, I tell you what, if I saw a joyful, thankful, enthusiastic slave, that would be my ninth wonder of the world. That, that must have blown people away. To have a slave probably more joyful, more thankful, more enthusiastic than the master. 
The poorest are happier than the richest. It's astounding. Well, it says to the masters, masters, you be sure and treat your slave as you would treat Christ. You know, I, I'm thinking of that verse in Matthew 25 where, where the people says, when did we ever um, feed you or give you anything to drink? And Jesus says, you know, when you did it to the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you did it to me. And so, you know, if, if you had that going on in the Roman Empire, which they did, not everybody, but, but it was happening through the power of the Spirit, masters and slaves, I mean, that is amazing. That is a wonder of the world. May the Lord make us all wonders of the world like that. Yeah. You know, may, may the Lord make us all, that's, that's what you're talking about, God's masterpiece. T too often, you know, Christianity gets boiled down to being nice people, you know, and doing good deeds. We, now we're talking about serious stuff. <laughs> that is something that is supernatural. Oh, um, these people, these astounding slaves weren't working for themselves. They weren't working for their master. That was a secret, really. They were working for the ultimate master, Jesus Christ. They weren't working only for this earth. They were working for eternal rewards. That's what they, they were setting their focus on. Now, um, when I was in my insurance job, um, I was really good for a little while. I didn't like the job. Um, and then I started, when I, as I mentioned, I started getting, um, I started losing my patience and my faith. I thought, man, am I, did I make a big mistake? Did the Lord really tell me just wait? Or did, I, did he tell me just wait for a year or two? Did I blow past a stop sign somewhere? You know, um, and so th there was two different occasions where I walk. I remember specifically, it was actually the same exact scenario. I was working overtime without pay because it's a salary job. And I'm walking out, going to my car, and man, I let loose in prayer. It wasn't uh, intercessory. It was complaining, <laughs> I call it, you know. And um, it's like, whoa, Lord, what's going on? What are you doing? And, and um, tw it happened twice. And the funny thing is I got the same answer twice. The same, and then I stopped. I never did it again after that. I got the idea. And the answer was, I thought you wanted my will. Do you still want my will? You know, see, for, for me, the test of, of serving Christ wasn't whether I was being will willing to be a missionary in West Africa. For me, the test was whether I was willing to be a, a claims adjuster in the Coachella Valley. Um, you know, it, it, Jesus says even pagans love their family and friends. You know, um, it takes the power of God to love your enemies. And in the same way, I would say anybody can be enthusiastic about a job that they like, but it takes the power of God to be enthusiastic about a job you don't like or, in fact, perhaps you really hate, but you have incredible enthusiasm for it because you are incredibly enthusiastic about serving Christ. Anyway, anything, it doesn't matter. And, and that is the supernatural power of God that he wants to give to us in our lives to be able to do that. Um, no, I did get to the place, um, I'm proud to say, where I actually prayed and told the Lord, okay, Lord, I got it. I will be willing to work here at this insurance company for the rest of my life if you want me to. Because I'd rather be an anointed slave than an ordinary master. You know, I would rather be an anointed claims adjuster than an ordinary missionary or an ordinary pastor. <laughs> and so I got that far, but I have to say I didn't get too en enthusiasm. <laughs> I could see it. <laughs> There's the peak. But, oh, man, I'm hurting. <laughs> I don't think I can make it. <laughs> now, the interesting thing is that um, my son, Michael, uh, hit the peak. He went up to the top and hit enthusiasm. And it's his first, and I hope you don't mind. I was going to mention that to you, Michael, if you don't mind me sharing. Go ahead, yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, I'm in the middle of it. <laughs> sort of in the middle of it now. <laughs> kind of the point of no return. <laughs> That's a good story. Um, but his first job was kind of ordinary. Second job starts out ordinary. A couple months in, I think it was. Was it a couple months? I don't know how long it was. Yeah. And uh, he gets a revelation. Uh, that's what, he, maybe you don't know. Uh, to me, it's like totally a revelation from the Lord with desire and power. And the revelation was, you know what? Um, even though, you know, he was not excited about uh, the job on days like this and just, you know, you're doing the same thing all the time. The revelation and the desire and the power was, I'm going to do this job so great. I'm going to do this job with excellence. I'm going to go the extra mile 
for my boss. I'm going to do it for my customers, my fellow workers, for everyone. And he did. He started doing that. And um, you can imagine if you get an, an attitude like that, it's going to change your experience at work every day. And you could tell that it was actually Holy Spirit, eternal life, because he did it every day for months. Every day. Um, you know, we, we can have our peaks and valleys, right? You know, where it's like, oh, man, I'm really going to have a great week this week. And uh, Wednesday comes along. It's like, ooh, I don't know what they call it, hump day. <laughs> it's like, um, but this is when the spirit comes, it says the spirit brings eternal life. Eternal life does not wear out like that. Our emotions wear out. Our, our you know, determination can wear out some quicker than others. But eternal life, it does not wear out. It's like Abraham says, his faith just got even stronger. And so um, his, when he finally quit to become a, a youth pastor, his boss actually mailed him a letter of recommendation. Wow. I wouldn't have believed it, but I saw it with my own eyes. It's like, man, I never got a letter of recommendation when I left the gas station. What the heck? <laughs> he got a letter of recommendation. And then he did, this, he did the same thing at his next job in a golf uh, club. He did the same thing in Reading um, in, as a server. And, and he started doing the same thing here. He's going to begin working with us at, at JPL with the youth. I'm confident he'll do the same thing there as well. We'll be an, uh, announcing that later. You get a sneak preview because we'll, then we'll pray over him. But the... the Thing is, from, from, from that, ex you know, seeing that was a joy to me, to see him actually um, doing that. Because I really have not seen it very often. I'm sure some here people, some of you do it, but I just haven't seen it. You know, I haven't really um, done it. I wouldn't count, you know, I'm enthusiastic here, but that doesn't count because I, I enjoy this. It's in, you know, for me it counts if it's something I don't really in enjoy. You know, when I'm talking about that kind of enthusiasm. But uh, what I see is that God doesn't want us to use our job as a place to do mission. I mean, he does, but what God wants us to do is to use our job or the activity as mission. It's like the actual work you do, whether you're doing a lawn or a pool or serving someone, that actual work is the ministry. Right. You, know, you know, and we, we do it really well for them because we're, we're actually doing ministry to them for the Lord right now, for, for that person. And, of course, the Holy Spirit can, can let us know, you know, to pray, care, and share, and and to heal or to pray for someone, uh, um, to, you know, prophecy or whatever that may be. But I know that the Holy Spirit really wants to empower us all the time to love and honor the company, um, to love and honor the supervisors, um, the customers, treat them like gold, um, the fellow employees. If, if you're a supervisor, to, treat, to do the same thing, love and honor the company and the customers and, and the people under you. Treat them like Christ. Um, and, you know, when, when we do st that, actually we become a human heavenly portal in the most unlikely of places. It keep, takes people completely by surprise. They go into this McDonald's for a hamburger and they run into a heavenly portal behind the counter. You, you know, wh wherever we go, it's just the glory of God. Like, like Jesus was so humble when he came into, you know, into, into poverty in Nazareth and or wherever it was, but in, into the, the, the manger and everything. And, and it's like he's still doing the same thing, putting Jesus in these most unlikely places and people. It, it, to me, it's like um, you radiate the very glory of God where you go to people who maybe never even thought about going to church. But now you gave them a taste of the kingdom of God, and they see that it's good. And they're wondering, where does your joy come from? And they're right next to you. They understand and what we, where is that coming from? You know, it's, it's a remarkable opportunity for us um, to, for the glory of God. Uh, that We did the last year, and we're, we're um, just completing it, the Building for the Kingdom campaign. And it's about, really, it was hard for me to, to communicate um, because it isn't necessarily involves buildings, but not about a building campaign. But it's about building a church that produces and equips people like that to go out into their community, on, that, that are portals out, out there. That's what it's about. And it takes some horsepower for us to connect to the Holy Spirit to equip people like that. You know, um, and, and, you know, and, and he, the Lord wants us to do it inside and outside the church, just like we saw in the book of Acts. 
Now, Ephesians 4, um, 11 says that God um, has given these gifts to the church. Christ has given these gifts to the church, the apostle, the prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. And their responsibility is to equip. See, so many people think their responsibility is to do the ministry. No. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his ministry, to do his work, and build up the church, the body of Christ. And this will continue... In other words, the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teacher will keep on equipping until we come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of Jesus Christ that we'll be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. There's another giant word. Think about, that's your identity. That's my identity. We have the capacity in us to grow until we are into the full and complete standard of Christ. And these slaves I'm talking about, that's where they were. They were little Jesuses disguised as a slave. <laughs> little heavenly portals in the most unlikely of place you could imagine, radiating the glory of God, catching people on fire. Now, um, building up the church, it includes um, serving in the church, of course, when you build up the church. We have people that do that, that do the programs. We have people preparing food, setting up, cleaning up, tearing down, um, worship, Inside here, ushering, greeting, children's ministry. You know, we got a lot of, of um, workers in here. In fact, we've gotten compliments from the last couple of special speakers. It says, you guys have so many um, ministers in here, you know, so many people that are, are serving. And, and those people, if they capture that and do it with joy and thanksgiving and enthusiasm for the glory of God, they become portals right in the church. And they release incredible power that's what makes the church apostolic. If you have people like that releasing their, their power through their humble service, it's, it creates an atmosphere. And, and people that come around you and serve with you catch it. That's part of, of what we want to build. But it also involves going outside and in having God, God encounters, giving people God encounters, inviting them to come into the family of God, the house of God. And then us, when they invite them in, we welcome them in, 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 into God's church. And, and so we build up the church in quality among ourselves, and we also build it up as, as um, in, in the book of Acts as they added people to it. Now, um, I was taught when I was um, in college, Bible school, that the um, gifts of apostle and prophet stopped. God said, okay, you don't need those anymore because now you have the Bible. So there's no need for apostles and prophets. Well, it doesn't say that anywhere in the Bible. I can tell you that because I wondered even when they, I believed them when they, what they told me, but I'm like, okay, I, I don't see it, but okay. But, but now I see that as really a theological justification for the lack of supernatural power in the church. That's, what I, that's my, my view of it. And as long as we hold on to that theology, we're going to continue to keep the supernatural from coming into the church because we need these apostles and prophets to release that kind of equipping power that could possibly equip an astounding slave like that or an astounding pool man or pool woman or whatever they be like that. You need some serious power to live like that. Wouldn't you agree with me? Yes. It's not like, here's what you do, step one, step two, now put on your smile. You, you know, um, God did not, with these slaves, God did not deal these people a bad hand Say, well, sorry about your lot in life. You know, this guy gets to be a king, but you're, oops, you fell on a slave. Sorry, but put a smile on your face. I don't ever want to see you frowning. You act like you're joyful now, and, and you better be thankful. I don't want to hear any complaining out of you. you know, it's not like that at all. The, the power of the Lord comes upon people like these slaves, and the joy just gushes out. And the thanksgiving is just natural and flows, and the enthusiasm is just there. They're just loving life because it's the life of Christ. They know they've won the lotto because they have eternal life. This life goes by. That's what the kind of power that God wants to release in us. Now, um, Jesus didn't just use his spiritual gifts in the temple or synagogue. He used them on the road, right? When you read the, the Gospels, he used them on the road. He used them in houses. He used them in fields. He used them on mountains and valleys and, and wherever we went. And revival is the manifestation of the life and ministry of Jesus on the earth. And we can imagine it. It takes place in the church, and it takes place out of the church. The church actually is people. The building is just a building. You can turn this into any building you want to, for anything. But the church, when we leave, the church leaves. The church goes 
And, and that's where we want to see revival. How oh, Dr. Mark Tubbs was really interesting. The first time he came out, he really shocked me because I only thought of apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. I pretty much thought of them in the church. But he pointed out that, hey, 95, 99% of your life is lived out of church. Those gifts equip you for life outside of the church, not just inside the church. And he gave some examples. Like if an apostle equips you, you're likely, and, and you have that kind of, that there's different, you know, levels of apostle, giftings, they're all a mix. But if you have that, then those kind of people bring heaven to earth. You know, they're all about, they, you know, they, they like to make things happen. They see things happen. They like to create unity. That's kind of an ap apostolic gift. The, the prophet, they, they like to hear the Lord for themselves and to encourage other people. The evangelists, you know, they're out there um, mixing with people that don't know the Lord and sharing with them and, and persuading and praying and prophesying, whatever they do to get people in. Um, that's an easy one because that one mainly happens outside the church. The pastors, you know, they're, community, they're caring people. Um, they care for individuals. They'll really listen, really take their time with you. You know, the teachers, they're all into, hey, this is how it's done. You know, they, they, um, they know how to, and actually they know how to make the Bible um, uh, work in your life. That's, that's what a, a true teacher, they can help you show how the Bible works, not just knowledge of what it says, but how it actually can work in your life. And so all these traits can be used inside and outside the church. And so I have a few examples I wanted to give you of that. Um, uh, the apostles, this is apostles in the workplace. In China, I've heard of these boss men, they call them. I imagine there's some women too. But these boss men, they are entrepreneurs. They, have, they know how things work in China. They have um, powerful political um, business influence. And they use their, their knowledge and influence to go and start churches. They start schools. I was told they know how to make them. Don't make them too big or the government will come down. You've got to make them just the right size. You know, they just know how to make it work. And they're released in different places all over China making things happen this way. I, I, Michael Dalton had ran into him, and I asked him about him. He says, are they doing signs and wonders? He said, this is what he said, not yet, but yet. <laughs> so we'll see what happens there. Um, but they've got some, of, some, some kind of an apostolic gifting on, on them of some kind. Um, and then the, the prophets. I, I have a, some of you know Pastor D.C. Um, and she told me that she is, she's now working. She, she's been a pastor, but she's working in a financial institution. She gave her boss a word of knowledge, not about his life, about his business, about a business decision. And... Um, how did it work out? Well, he told her, you know, I don't know what it is you did, but if you ever get another one of those, would you please tell me? <laughs> uh, you know, um, we've got evangelists like um, uh, around, uh, like Jeff um, is here, I think. Is Jeff's here? Is Jeff here? Maybe he's not. Oh, yeah. Oh, you're, there, you're representing Jeff. He's out evangelizing, but McKenzie's here. <laughs> he probably literally is. Oh, he's going to the Grand Canyon. Okay. To evangelize. Yeah. Yeah. So there you go. Uh, so, Lord, we just pray for Jeff and Mackenzie. We thank you, Lord, and thank you for the evangelists in our midst. Lord, and we just pray that you continue to bring them from glory to glory. I've, I've got people um, uh, like Dennis Schroeder tells me stories every once in a while. He'll go around his pools, and he shares the gospel and prays for people like a, like a mobile pastor. Just going around there, you know, you get your pool and your soul cleaned, you know. <laughs> it's pretty nice. <laughs> I think of Tom Reese. I don't know where Tom's at right now. But Tom uh, was a pastor and a teacher. He was in a public school. Did a little teaching. Did a little pastoring. Pastored the kids. I'm sure he pastored teachers, in, you know, out in the, in the workplace. Um, I, I don't want to go into the whole story, but I once lost an election that they, somebody made me run. And I says, okay, I'll run. Um, uh, for the gate committee at a local school district level. And I didn't really want to do it until I <laughs> lost the election. Then I'm like, oh, bummer, you know? <laughs> so I don't want to lose an election. <laughs> but anyhow, the guy that won the election, after he got the glory of winning the election, he says he couldn't do it. And then they said, I get to go and do it. It's like, I don't even get the glory of the election. I just got to do all the work. <laughs> but I ended up, Believe it or not, without winning an election, I ended up being the vice president of the gate committee of the district level in like three weeks. 
And I told him, I says, I don't even know what you guys are doing. That's, that was my election speech for the vice president. He says, honestly, I don't know what this even is, but if I can help, I'll be glad to help. <laughs> All right, you're our man. And then to top it off, I, the voice transferred out of the district. They says, well, you can't serve anymore. So, okay, well, I was vice president for a brief moment of time, and then I was deposed. And I thought, what's that all about? And I, I really honestly believe the Lord was showing me how easily he can raise a person up with favor and influence in politics, education, business, any place where you want to serve and you're willing. Because that's all I said. I did not want to do any of those jobs, actually. I just said, I want to be part of my boy's education, I just want to serve you guys. I don't want to be a protester carrying signs around the school unless I'm serving first. <laughs> you know, then I'll go to the principal. Hey, we know each other. Let me talk to you about something. But I never did have to do that. I served. And if, if we do that, I believe the Lord can just bring us up. We all have spiritual gifts, and they're powerful. They have uncommon wisdom. They have uncommon power um, as we learn to use them. And when you use them in a group of people, they're going to wonder, what is that? You know, what is going on here? You'll be bringing the wisdom and the power and the love of Christ right into, uh, right into meetings. Um, and so we have our Discover JPL, our, our membership. Part of it is we, we encourage people to, to think about what is your spiritual gifts? Do you know what they are? You know, can we help you explore that and, and help you to use them inside the church and outside the church? And the Spirit will guide us all if we keep going into an extraordinary everyday life. Not an ordinary. We're not, I, our identity is not ordinary. Amen. Everyone is called to be, have that extraordinary life. It's a rich and satisfying, abundant life. So the Prudians attended the church. I, I love it because they said when you drove out of the parking lot, there was a sign there. It says, you are now entering the mission field. <laughs> you know, when you, when you drove out of church, yeah, I like that. You know, and, and like we said, Paul says, whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus. God told Joshua, wherever you walk, wherever you set your feet, you're on land that I've given you. Yeah. Jesus says, you're the salt of the earth, the light of the world. And, you know, the uh, early church had no political power, but they had serious spiritual power. And they transformed their lives, their homes, their job sites, their communities. And without winning a single election over a period of 300 years, they transformed that entire Roman Empire.